You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Recent changes in federal law have meant that more appellate and district courts are more frequently involved in death penalty case appeals. And that means staff in clerk's offices must be aware of changes and new interpretations that affect these important cases. To help your court better understand these changes, live from our studios, the Federal Judicial Center presents Capital Case Issues Update. Featuring Ira Robbins, Professor of Law and Justice at American University here in Washington, D.C., and Cynthia Rapp, Staff Attorney at the Supreme Court of the United States. This program will focus on the law, related case updates, and changes in how the Supreme Court processes death penalty case appeals. Now here's your host, Fran Toller. Welcome to our broadcast. We're happy to have you with us today. In 1996, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, commonly called ADEPA, made significant changes in the law of federal habeas corpus. Many of the provisions in Chapter 153, Section 28 of the United States Code were amended, and a new chapter, 154, dealing exclusively with death penalty cases was added. As you know, these changes created interpretive problems in three areas the effect of the new law on pending cases, the prerequisites for invoking Chapter 154, and the interpretation of particular provisions of Chapter 153. More than four years have passed since ADEPA was enacted. Now is an appropriate time to update the staffs of appellate and district clerk's offices about the impact of the law as it relates to death penalty cases, current and pending cases that may affect how the law is interpreted, and federal court issues related to the processing of death penalty cases. Joining us today are Ira Robbins, Professor of Law and Justice, Washington College of Law, American University, Cynthia Rapp, Staff Attorney, Supreme Court of the United States, and Judy Roberts, Chief Clerks Programs here at the FJC. Let's take a couple of moments to review our agenda today. First, Professor Robbins will review ADEPA's impact on the habeas statute and recent Supreme Court decisions related to death penalty cases. This will be followed by a question and answer period. We'll take a five minute break and then Judy Roberts will talk with Cynthia Rapp about death penalty cases from a federal court perspective, followed by a Q&A with Ms. Rapp. Finally, Professor Robbins and I will return for brief closing remarks. A couple of other reminders before we begin. You will be able to fax or phone in your questions for both question and answer periods. The numbers are shown on your screen. Also, all of the materials are posted on the FJC's DCN intranet website, including evaluations and roster forms. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Robbins. Welcome, Ira. Thank you very much, Fran. I'm going to be making many points regarding the writ of habeas corpus, both general and specific. Uh, let me begin with the purpose of habeas corpus. Certainly I'm overgeneralizing here, but I don't think unfairly. The purpose of habeas corpus is to review the constitutionality of convictions and sentences. It's not to review any unfairness, but only constitutional unfairness. The writ, however, is not totally open-ended. There are numerous restrictions, many of which I'll address in the next half hour or so. As a result of these restrictions, habeas corpus has become extremely complicated. There are numerous threshold questions that district judges especially, but also appellate judges have to address, questions that we didn't have uh, just 20 years ago. Justice Breyer, in a case decided in April of this year, referred to the complexity of the Supreme Court's habeas corpus jurisprudence, which he called a complexity that in practice can deny the fundamental constitutional protection that habeas corpus seeks to assure. He also said that our system of dealing with some of the habeas restrictions has an attractive power only for those who like difficult puzzles, and habeas corpus is certainly difficult. Consider the difficulty for litigants, especially for pro se litigants, as I go through some of the provisions of the recent enactment. 
apart from addressing the merits, that is to say, the alleged constitutional violation in his or her case, the litigant must also confront the numerous intricacies of habeas corpus. These points were made clear by a judge in the Eighth Circuit just two weeks ago. He wrote, not only has the procedural web of habeas corpus taken on a life of its own, but it has developed its own unique nomenclature, and it certainly is unique. Uh, he continued, rather than addressing the underlying merits of the constitutional claims asserted by a petitioner for habeas relief, opinions and habeas actions are now riddled with terms like procedural default, cause and prejudice, abuse of the writ, successive petitions, mixed petitions, adequate and independent state law grounds, the look through presumption, objective factors external to the defense, the presumption of correctness, and many more uh, of these doctrines and sub-doctrines. All of these together serve as a trap for the unwary pro se litigant. As if this weren't enough in terms of the complexity of habeas corpus, Congress added new restrictions in 1996. The Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act passed on April 24th of that year. Uh, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes now talking about the structure of that act just to set up some of the discussion regarding the provisions and the exception. The act contains on habeas corpus two chapters, chapter 153 and 154. Chapter 153 is entitled General Habeas Corpus Reform Provisions. Chapter 154 is entitled Special Habeas Corpus Procedures in Capital Cases. Uh, let me address the second one first. Chapter 154 can best be called an opt-in provision. If the states provide a certain level of counsel, quality counsel, competent counsel for state death row inmates, and they have a mechanism for that provision for all death row inmates who want counsel, then the states get certain benefits in return, such as a shorter statute of limitations and a statute of limitations on district and appellate courts to decide these cases. To date, and, and perhaps I'll have more time to address this later, but to date, no jurisdiction has satisfied the opt-in provisions. Therefore, Chapter 154 right now doesn't apply in any case. So we look at Chapter 153. Chapter 153 contains the general habeas corpus reform provisions, which apply now in all non-death cases, as well as in all death cases in which the state has not opted in, which means all death cases today. The statute, however, is inartfully drafted. In fact, it's a very sloppy statute. Many judges have said so and, it ha and in fact, have written that uh, in their published opinions. Justice Souter, in one of the first cases to come down after the passage of the new statute, wrote, in a world of silk purses and sow's ears, this act is not a silk purse in the art of statutory drafting. Uh, in effect, there are many internal inconsistencies in this statute. Courts have had a hard time with the statute. Indeed, one of the provisions, until the Supreme Court stepped in in April, had the Federal Courts of Appeals giving us six or seven or even eight different interpretations of the same language. Uh, with that as the structure, let me now shift over to an overview of some of the most important provisions of this new law, uh, basically to provide some framework and some background. It's important, and in many cases literally critical, to understand the nuances of the habeas process, especially those nuances that are being litigated heavily. I'm going to address the following topics in, in my portion of the time. First, the statute of limitations. Then the new and very important section 2254D. Third, I'll address federal evidentiary hearings. Next, the appeals process. And finally, successive petitions. Along the way, I'm going to mention relevant case law, particularly case law from the United States Supreme Court. But now let me get on to statute of limitations. Until 1996, there was no such thing as a statute of limitations on habeas corpus. Habeas was purely an equitable remedy. It was not unheard of for inmates to file for a habeas writ as long as a quarter of a century or more after the conviction and sentence became final. Uh, and in fact, there have been grants of habeas corpus uh, after 25 or 30 years or so. Under the new statute, however, that wouldn't occur. Uh, the limitations period under the 1996 Act is one year. 
But to say that the statute of limitations is, is, is one year belies many interesting, subtle questions lurking beneath the surface. For example, when does the one year begin to run? Note that the one year applies to both state and federal prisoners. We have a split among the circuits on when the year begins to run for federal prisoners. Let's assume a federal prisoner, uh, having been denied habeas corpus at the district level, uh, wants to get into federal court and, and uh, doesn't apply for cert. When does that time uh, for cert, uh, how does that time for cert affect the statute of limitations? Well, if the inmate doesn't go for cert, some circuits are saying that the time for the one year beginning to run is from the issuance of the mandate from the Court of Appeals. Uh, other circuits are saying, however, that even if the inmate doesn't file for cert, the time of the statute of limitations doesn't start to run until the time for filing for cert has expired. And we have a five to two split uh, on that question. Regarding state prisoners, uh, we have a tolling of the statute of limitations. The statute tolls while there is a properly filed application for state post-conviction or other collateral relief pending in the state courts. But what does properly filed mean? Is it a question under federal law or under state law? Here, too, the circuits are split. Most of the circuits, by a, a, a vote of four to two at this point, a split of four to two, most of the circuits are saying that properly filed is a question of state law, not federal law. Another nice question is how much of the time in the state courts is told? Only that time during which some filing is actually pending or the in-between time as well, uh, in between a denial at a lower state court and the time for filing for appeal in the higher state court. The circuits, interestingly, are all in agreement on this one. Six circuits have ruled, and all of them have said that the in-between time counts as tolling time as well. Many of you out there may think that this is counterintuitive, and I've spoken with many people in the circuits who think that, but the circuits are of one mind on this question. Now, what about the time uh, while a petition for cert is pending in the Supreme Court. Uh, so far, uh, you should be aware the Supreme Court has not ruled on this question. But under Chapter 154, the opt-in provision, there is a special sub-provision that says that the time pending on cert in the Supreme Court counts as tolling time. There's no comparative uh, procedure or no comparative provision uh, in Chapter 153. Does that mean that Congress intentionally left it out? Uh, or does that mean that this is one of those internal inconsistencies and Congress didn't really think about the question? Two circuits have ruled on this question so far regarding Chapter 153, and both of them say that uh, on Chapter 153, the time uh, pending for a petition for certain the Supreme Court does not count as tolling time. Uh, so litigants certainly have to keep that in mind. Or what happens if a petition is pending in federal court and it's denied, let's say, for lack of exhaustion? It might be pending there for a year or more. Does that year or more count against the one-year statute of limitations, or is that tolling time? Here the circuits are split, one to one. So you can see just with the statute of limitations how complicated it can get. If there are so many circuit splits, how is a litigant supposed to get it right? Uh, whatever getting it right actually means. Uh, and of course, when we're dealing with statutes of limitations, every extra day is important uh, from the prisoner's perspective. Two other points on statute of limitations. First, constitutionality. And I can generalize from this to other restrictions as well. The Constitution of the United States uh, has the words habeas corpus in only one place. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2, which states the following. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. Well, if we have a statute of limitations, which we didn't have before, does that count as an unconstitutional suspension of the writ? Several circuits have ruled on the question generally, saying there is no per se unconstitutional suspension, but some of the circuits, especially the second, have allowed for the possibility that there might be an unconstitutional suspension as applied in particular cases. My final point on statutes of limitations is that all of the circuits that have ruled on the question so far have said that it is not a jurisdictional issue. 
meaning if the state doesn't raise the statute of limitations, the federal court doesn't have to consider it. It may if it wishes to, but it's not obligated to do so. Seven circuits have ruled on this question. All seven are in agreement. Let's move on from statute of limitations to what I call the federal court's adjudication function. There is a controversy generally uh, regarding federal habeas corpus. That is to say, in federal habeas corpus, federal judges have the power to undo all that occurred in the state court system. Uh, with that sort of federal-state system or federal-state relationship, there's always going to be conflict. The question is, how can we avoid, if at all, unnecessary conflict? Or put differently, do we want federal review of state court convictions and sentences to be de novo or deferential? This was the precise question uh, that was raised in a Supreme Court case called Wright v. West in 1992. Should habeas in federal court be de novo review, complete independent plenary review of what went on in, in the state system, or should we defer in some way, presume the correctness of what went on in the state system? By a vote of six to three in Wright v. West, the court decided that habeas should continue to be de novo, as it has been for most of this century. Now, that happened only eight years ago. Uh, so why even say that the question is ripe for reconsideration today? The answer is that four years ago, we got the new statute, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. One of the key provisions in that law, uh, perhaps, to my mind, the key provision of all of them, uh, is the new 28 U.S. Code, Section 2254D. It's a long provision. It's a convoluted provision. But in part, it says that a federal writ of habeas corpus shall not be granted to a state prisoner's claim unless the adjudication of the claim in the state court involved an unreasonable application of law to fact in the state system. So we have to ask, what exactly do we mean by an unreasonable application? This is the key question. This is the question that has plagued the lower federal courts, which have given us six, seven, or eight different interpretations, depending on how you understand uh, these circuit court opinions. Now, without getting too bogged down in the nuances of these interpretations, they really fall into two different patterns. One focuses on whether, in the state court system, there was an unreasonable application of law to facts. I call this the unreasonable application approach or pattern. The other is whether the jurists in the state system were unreasonable in the way they applied the law to the facts. I call this the unreasonable jurist approach. Several circuits, including the 4th, 5th, 7th, and 11th, uh, had adopted variants of the unreasonable jurist approach. The 4th Circuit statement, uh, the one that went up to the Supreme Court this year, uh, basically was the following. It asked whether the state's application of law to facts cannot be unreasonable, or it said the state's application of law to facts cannot be unreasonable unless reasonable jurists would all agree that it was unreasonable. That's a tough test to satisfy. Uh, if this was the test that the Supreme Court had adopted, I submit that it would have meant the end of federal court review of state court convictions. Instead, the Supreme Court reversed the Fourth Circuit in a case called Williams against Taylor, uh, there were two Williams cases, Williams against Taylor this year, so this one was Terry Williams. In Terry Williams against Taylor, the court rejected the reasonable jurist test. The court said that the federal habeas court, the court should not transform the inquiry into a subjective one, in effect by finding some jurist who would support it. Although the court was split on many other issues in the case, all nine justices agreed, and this is rare to get all nine justices to agree on something to do with habeas corpus. All nine justices agreed that the Fourth Circuit's approach was too restrictive. Five justices said that the most important point is that an unreasonable application of federal law is different from an incorrect application of federal law. That is to say, a state's application of law to fact might be incorrect, but it might not be unreasonable. So in effect, the court struck a middle ground. Unlike the Fourth Circuit, the Supreme Court rejected a subjective, reasonable jurist test. But the court also rejected the approach of four of the justices, 
led by Justice Stevens, who argued that if the state court was wrong in its application of law to fact on a particular constitutional claim, then its decision was necessarily unreasonable. Uh, the majority did not buy that. One or two other words about this section 2254D. Note that although the Supreme Court did not address the following point in its decision, many of the circuits have addressed the question, is the new 2254D jurisdictional? The answer is, at least to date, no, it is not jurisdictional. Now, 2254D is complicated. Habeas corpus is complicated. If it's difficult for you sitting out there to understand this, to understand some of these things that I've pointed out already, imagine how it resonates or imagine how it doesn't resonate with a pro se litigant, particularly one who happens to be illiterate. Let's shift now to the topic of federal evidentiary hearings. Habeas corpus, as I pointed out, is both complicated and controversial. It doesn't get any more controversial when the state has taken the time to hold a hearing, perhaps an extensive hearing, and the federal court goes and reconsiders the facts as well as the application of law to fact. In 1966, Congress gave us what is called a presumption of correctness of state court findings of fact. It was a rebuttable presumption, and there were seven ways to rebut it. I don't want to say that it was easy to rebut it, uh, but it was not all that difficult because some of those seven ways to rebut the presumption were rather open-ended. Under the new Habeas Act, passed in 1996, however, those seven ways to rebut the presumption have been repealed. There are some similarities, but those seven ways have been repealed. So we do have uh, a greater amount, a greater increment of presumption of correctness of state court findings of fact. But there's one nice issue that's worth addressing now, one that went up to the Supreme Court this year, and that has to do with a provision called 28 U.S. Code 2254E2, which states the following. If the applicant has failed to develop the factual basis of a claim in state court proceedings, then the court shall not hold an evidentiary hearing on the claim unless the applicant shows a combination of the following three things a new rule of constitutional law made retroactive, a factual predicate that could not have been previously discovered through the exercise of due diligence, and the actual innocence of the underlying claim. Now, whenever you have a doctrine or subdoctrine that requires actual factual innocence, of course it's going to be difficult to satisfy. Uh, for a prisoner to get an evidentiary hearing only if he or she can show actual innocence, means that more than 99% of state prisoners in federal court will not be getting evidentiary hearings. So interpreting this provision is very important. And one of the interesting issues or interpretations that has developed under the provision is the following. Remember the language says, if the applicant has failed to develop the material facts. Well, the respondents, uh, the prosecutors, the representatives of the attorney general's offices have been arguing that this is really a strict liability provision. It doesn't matter whether it's the applicant who didn't develop the facts or the judge or the prosecutor. If the material facts haven't been developed, then there can be no hearing. That's not the way the law has gone, or at least the way it has been interpreted. Uh, that is a position taken by the AGs that is contrary to that taken by every single federal circuit to have addressed the question, uh, and by the Supreme Court as well. The Supreme Court decided the issue this year on April 18th in a case called Williams v. Taylor. This Williams v. Taylor was Michael Williams v. Taylor. Note regarding the two Williams v. Taylor cases. Both were habeas corpus cases dealing with issues under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1996. Both were from the Fourth Circuit, and both were reversed by the Supreme Court. Uh, those of you sitting out there from the Ninth Circuit know that the Ninth Circuit uh, has not had a great record in the Supreme Court on habeas corpus with many reversals, sometimes unanimous. Uh, well, the good news for the Ninth Circuit is that this year uh, the, the Fourth Circuit uh, is the one that took the brunt of Supreme Court habeas reversals. Uh, so I hope you're listening to this both in the Ninth Circuit, maybe you'll breathe a sigh of relief, uh, and in the Fourth Circuit as well where uh, maybe your court has been pushing the envelope of interpretation, at least with respect to the cases that were in the Supreme Court this year. So note that in Michael Williams v. Taylor, the Supreme Court here too found for the prisoner, uh, remanding the case for an evidentiary hearing 
on one of the issues. Now we'll shift over to the topic of appeals, uh, which many of you have a great deal of contact with. On appeals, there is a requirement now under the new law that once habeas has been denied in the district court, in order for the Court of Appeals to have jurisdiction, the prisoner must get a certificate of appealability from either the district court or the appellate court. The counterpart in the old law was something that was called a certificate of probable cause. The basic purpose of this certificate is to show that there is some non-frivolous issue worthy of review. Now, under the old certificate of probable cause practice, only the state inmate had to get it, not the federal inmate, and certainly not the state either if the state lost below. Uh, so a very important point here is that under the new act, not only state prisoners who want to appeal denials of habeas, but also federal prisoners who want to appeal denials of Section 2255 relief <coughs> must get a certificate of appealability. There are lots of interesting issues regarding the certificate, but I'm going to focus on one and one only in light of the recent Supreme Court decision. And that concerns the standard for granting the certificate. Under the old law, the standard for granting a certificate of probable cause was whether the prisoner could make a substantial showing of the denial of a federal right. Under the new law for certificates of appealability, the prisoner must make a substantial showing of denial, not of a federal right, but of a constitutional right, which, it, which probably, although it hasn't been interpreted all that much by a lot of courts, which probably means we have a higher threshold here. What should happen when a district court denies a habeas petition on procedural grounds, such as exhaustion or procedural default, without reaching uh, the prisoner's underlying constitutional claim? Certainly, in and of itself, a procedural ground is not usually of constitutional dimension. So does that mean that a certificate of appealability can never be granted in these circumstances? If it does mean that, uh, then since most district court rulings in habeas cases are procedural, there could never be an appeal to the Court of Appeals. Well, the Supreme Court addressed that question this year in a case called Slack v. McDaniel, and it ruled that a certificate of appealability should issue when the prisoner shows, at the least, the following two things. First, that jurists of reason would find it debatable whether the petition states a valid claim of the denial of a constitutional right. And second, that jurists of reason would find it debatable whether the district court was correct in its procedural ruling. In other words, cutting to the chase on this, the Supreme Court held that the jurisdiction of the courts of appeals on certificates of appealability survives. The final topic that I'm going to address now is successive petitions. I'm going to address it uh, under both types of successive petitions. There are two types. They are called same claim successive petitions and new claim successive petitions. A same claim successive petition is a claim filed later in a petition in federal court that is identical to a claim filed earlier on habeas in federal court. A new claim successive petition is a new claim filed in a later petition that might have been presented in an earlier federal habeas petition, but was not. The rule for a same claim successor is simply stated in the statute, New, uh, for a same claim successor, uh, simply stated, same claim successive petitions shall be dismissed. That's it. That's all the statute says on that. As for new claim successors, however, it says that new claim successive petitions shall be dismissed unless the prisoner can satisfy a certain standard, which again is some combination of the reason for not raising it or a new rule of constitutional law made retroactive and actual innocence of the underlying claim. But looking at the procedure here for satisfying that standard, the district courts do not have the power to decide that a particular claim meets the test. Instead, the Court of Appeals, serving as a gateway, has to make the decision whether to authorize the district court to go ahead and file the claim. Now, according to the statute, the Court of Appeals has 30 days from the filing of the motion for authorization to make this claim, to make this determination. 
Now, what I'm about to say may sound absolutely ridiculous to you, uh, but it will show you the level of abstruseness that we have reached in habeas corpus practice. The courts of appeals are divided on the following question. What does 30 days mean? Some courts, what I call the strict 30-day courts, hold that 30 days means exactly that. You just add up the days from the filing of the motion for authorization, and once you hit 30, you need a decision. Other courts, however, are what I call flexible 30-day courts. And I should point out that most of the courts of appeals on this split among the circuits fall into the category of flexible 30-day courts. These courts hold that the 30 days referred to in the statute begins to run only after the court of appeals has obtained all of the papers required for a reasoned decision. Uh, and it may take uh, a month or two months or three months or longer to get all of the papers uh, required for due deliberation. Now on to a different issue, uh, staying within successive petitions. Because of the harshness, the true harshness, of the successive petitions rules, it should not be surprising that many inmates are claiming that their petitions are not successive. Because if they were successive, they would either have to be dismissed by the federal courts or the inmate would have to show actual innocence, also usually necessitating a dismissal. One good example uh, of holding that a, a, a second petition should not be treated as a second or successive petition is a case from the Supreme Court a couple of years ago called Stewart against Martinez Villarreal out of the Ninth Circuit. In this case, the inmate who was on a state death row, it happened to be in Arizona, was claiming that he was incompetent to be executed. There's a 1986 Supreme Court case holding that it's unconstitutional to execute someone who is incompetent. So the inmate raised this claim in federal court in Arizona and on through the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and, and the court said, it is a premature claim. We can't rule on your claim yet because the state of Arizona has not yet set an execution date. Case dismissed without prejudice to refiling. Well, as you might imagine, soon thereafter, the state of Arizona went ahead and did set an execution date. So the inmate came back into federal court. The question before the federal court raised by the respondent was, should this be treated as a second or successive petition? Should this be treated as a same claim successor? The inmate indeed, technically speaking, was raising the identical claim that happened to be dismissed without prejudice before. The Supreme Court, by a vote of seven to two, said, no way, we will not treat this as a same claim successive petition. Uh, in an opinion written by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the court wrote, to hold otherwise would mean that a dismissal of a first habeas petition for technical procedural reasons would bar the prisoner from ever obtaining federal habeas corpus review. An issue building on this one, which has not yet gotten to the Supreme Court directly, concerns exhaustion of state judicial remedies. Without belaboring the point, there's a general rule that ordinarily, before a state prisoner can get federal review of a claim, the prisoner must first present the claim to the state courts. Well, what happens if the prisoner presents a claim to the federal court and the federal court says, this issue has not been properly exhausted, so we dismiss without prejudice to refiling. The inmate goes back to the state, gets the issue exhausted, and comes back to federal court now. Is this a second or successive petition? Is this a same claim successor? Well, note, that is what some of the respondents have been arguing. Uh, in my opinion, they have been pushing the envelope when a case gets dismissed without prejudice to argue that when the case comes back, it's a same claim successive petition. Every single federal circuit to have ruled on the question, and now there are seven, eight, or nine circuits that have ruled on it, have in their opinions written the equivalent of, what, are you kidding? If we treated these as same claim successors and had to dismiss, that would give new meaning to, uh, to the term dismissal without prejudice. It would turn justice on its head. One reason that I mention this uh, is that a variant of this issue has made its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, on the following question, what should happen if a case is dismissed, a petition is dismissed for lack of exhaustion, uh, and when the inmate goes back to the state, he or she adds claims that were not present in that first petition and then comes back into federal court? 
This was another issue in the Slack v. McDaniel case that I mentioned before concerning certificate of appealability. On April 26th of this year, the Supreme Court decided that such a petition should not be considered a successive petition. So I think what we're seeing here, among other things, is the federal courts and uh, on occasion the Supreme Court looking at Congress's language and saying we really can't interpret it, uh, giving it its plain meaning because there is too much lurking under the surface. So just to conclude for now, let me point out I've mentioned four Supreme Court cases. The Supreme Court reversed in three of them, coming out in favor of the prisoner. In my opinion, this does not mean that the pendulum that favored prisoners on habeas in the 1960s and which swung back in favor of the government for the last quarter century is now swinging in favor of prisoners again. Rather, to me, it signifies that habeas is complex. There are many nuances. These cases are determined and these claims are determined on a case-by-case -case basis, but all now within the relatively tight parameters of the 1996 Act. But the complexity is aggravated by the fact that it's not enough to master the new habeas law that went into effect on April 24, 1996, because that law did not replace, did not repeal the, the major portion of the law that was in, in existence at that time. So note that we have a new habeas law that exists in tandem with the old law, much of which was not superseded. The bottom line, therefore, for now, is that we still do have the writ of habeas corpus, which exists to protect individuals from unjust conviction and even execution. It may not be as vigorous a writ as it used to be, but the Supreme Court has emphasized the continuing existence of the writ. So every participant in the process, including judges, law clerks, staff attorneys, court personnel, and attorneys, must understand his or her respective role in order to preserve what remains of the writ and to enforce it in appropriate cases. Uh, from this very brief presentation, I hope you can get a sense of the doctrinal context in which you do the critically important work that you do. Uh, and now we're going to move to the question and answer portion of the session. Thank you, Ira. We are now ready for your questions by phone or fax. The phone number is 888-871-3470. And the fax number is 800-488-0397. I understand that we have a call from Ohio Northern. Would you go ahead, please? Sure, I will. Thank you. Um, my question is really regarding the standard of review. Um, I have a case in which the Ohio Supreme Court articulated no, I guess, federal constitutional grounds on which it based its decision. So therefore, it's difficult for me to determine whether or not there was an unreasonable application of federal constitutional law. And I'm wondering if there is any case law out there that would then dictate what standard we should apply. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, and I, I didn't give you all of the language of 2254D, but if you've got a case on that, then of course you've seen the language. The, the statute says that before we get into this difficult to satisfy standard, uh, we have to make sure that there was a state decision on the merits. Uh, the question you're asking really goes to what do we mean by a state decision on the merits? Just because a state decided something doesn't necessarily mean that we can decipher what they decided. Uh, there's a parallel to this under the presumption of correctness under the old habeas corpus law, the old 2254D. And there are enough cases that you can use for analogy that say uh, if you can't unravel what the state court has done, then you don't have to defer to it. So I think those cases would be my starting point. Uh, and if you wanted to contact me sometime after this show, we could talk further about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your great question. Um, here's a question that's come in by fax. Um, can you explain why no states have opted into Chapter 154? Well, that also is a really good question. I didn't have enough time to address Chapter 154 uh, at the outset. Chapter 154, if you'll recall, is special habeas corpus procedures in capital cases. Uh, it creates a quid pro quo. If the states provide a mechanism for the appointment of competent counsel uh, and, and, and as well for the uh, reasonable compensation of counsel and for experts, 
uh, to any and all death row inmates who want counsel, then in return the state gets additional benefits, such as shorter statute of limitations. It goes to six months from one year. Uh, and there's also a limitations period on district and appellate judges deciding these cases. Uh, if we're in a Chapter 154 situation, then uh, district judges get 180 days to terminate the case, and appellate judges get 120 days to terminate the case. So why haven't states opted in? It seems to me that the answer is cost, in part, uh, and the generous restrictions on habeas that the states uh, already have. Uh, many states have stipulated that they don't satisfy the opt-in requirements. Some states have said, we think the benefits that we as a state get are already good enough. Uh, but there are some states that have litigated the question of whether they satisfy the opt-in requirements, in particular Florida and California, the, the states that have had this issue percolating up and down uh, between the district and, and circuit courts. Uh, and to me, it comes down to a question of cost. If the state wants certain benefits, it's going to have to pay for quality counsel at the state post-conviction stage. Okay. Uh, this fax uh, just in, um, this relates to the two cases uh, that were recently decided by the Supreme Court having to do with the incorrect actions of attorneys, one a defense attorney and one the prosecutor. Have we seen an increase or a decrease in these kinds of filings since the inception of ADEPA? That's a key question. Uh, the, the, the question of the issues concerning counsel both before the new law and after the new law. Uh, it seems to me clear that we get the best justice when we have highly skilled counsel on both sides for prosecution and defense. Uh, and typically in death cases, we don't have the best counsel in these cases uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, under the old law, we were seeing uh, in empirical studies that in about 42 percent of habeas cases, uh, there was a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel. And to the best of my knowledge, that number has not changed. We're still seeing the same sort of level uh, of claims of ineffective assistance. But note, it's hard to satisfy the test for ineffective assistance. Some of you may be familiar with a 1984 case called Strickland against Washington that sets the standard, sets the, th the threshold to satisfy. And it's a very high bar. Uh, the question then becomes, where are we after the statute, after the 1996 Act? It seems to me the starting point now is no longer Strickland v. Washington. We look at the, the new case, Terry Williams v. Taylor, which marks the first time since 1984 in which the Supreme Court said that an attorney in a criminal case violated the Sixth Amendment. Uh, so I think when all is said and done, we have a new starting point, but the problem remains. Uh, counsel uh, is not up to par in, in many or most of these cases. Uh, I believe we have a, call, a caller from Tennessee uh, Western. Uh, Greg, are you on the line? I am. Yeah. How are you all doing? Oh, we're doing great. <laughs> Professor Robbins, I wanted to offer a clarification. This is Gregory Krogh, the Senior Pro Se Staff Attorney for the Western District of Tennessee. Tennessee has actually, or at least they claim, that they have opted into Section Chapter 154. The only difficulty is, is they have not yet had any cases before our court, at least, in which the state post-conviction procedure took place under the revised state procedures so that Chapter 154 procedures would be applicable in federal court. Nevertheless, they have adopted the, the raw procedures that would entitle them to uh, Chapter 154 consideration when a state court case arrives at the federal court level after going through those procedures. Well, certainly you know more about what's going on in Tennessee than I do, but let me just react to your, your question. Just because the state says that it satisfies the opt-in procedure doesn't mean that when the case gets tested or the, the issue of their opt-in status gets tested in federal court that uh, the federal district court in Tennessee or the Sixth Circuit is going to agree. Uh, so uh, I'd, I'd say you know, they, they may act as if they're an opt-in state at this point, but once they go to seek some of the benefits in a particular case, then we're going to see the issue tested in the federal system. Now, I have no opinion about whether or not they've actually complied with that yet because that we, we don't give advisory opinions, obviously, but I thought you know the listeners ought to know that Tennessee is, is at least 
has at least gone to the effort of uh, trying to comply with the statute and they're attempting to, ins to put in procedures that would guarantee death row inmates uh, adequate counsel during collateral attacks. Uh, thank you, Greg, for that question, and that certainly um, that certainly opens up something for us that we hadn't uh, that we hadn't known about here at the center. This one, Ira, is a bit different. Uh, these two previous ones have been on uh, uh, points around the the law itself, but this one says recently the governor of Illinois declared a moratorium on executions after learning that a number of innocent people were executed. In your judgment, is this the start of a trend? Or can we assume that things will probably stay as they are? Well, you're right. This question is a little bit different. Uh, this is uh, more a political question, I, I think, than it is a judicial question. Uh, one reason I think that the governor of Illinois and, and now some other states have considered the question uh, imposed the moratorium is, is the fear of executing the innocent. And now with DNA testing uh, at the level uh, it has attained, uh, maybe we can get some assurances on this. The way this plays out in habeas cases is that uh, in many states there is a strict rule uh, against filing an application based on newly discovered evidence. In some states, the, I, I think there's a 21-day limit after the conviction and sentence for getting in new evidence. So what happens if we have DNA evidence at a much later date? Can we get it in? If the answer to that is yes, uh, then it means that we're going to see some relaxation in habeas corpus standards. Are we going to see that relaxation? It's hard to say. There are a couple of bills pending in Congress on this, uh, particularly one by Senator Leahy called something like the Innocence Protection Act of 2000. It's worth taking a look at that. But uh, let me just make a full circle back to where I started. Uh, that focuses on actual innocence. There's a concern about that. Habeas corpus up until recently has also focused on legal innocence. Even if the inmate is not actually innocent, can we still get some, uh, some federal court adjudication of whether the inmate was convicted or sentenced in violation of the Constitution? These are all questions that we're seeing uh, played out today. It's hard to know where it's going to go. Ira, I believe that we have a call from the Ninth Circuit. Are, who's, are, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And, and, who are, and who are you, please? I'm Maddie. OK. Um, and your question? OK, my question is, what happens where you have a state prisoner um, who, on direct appeal, the state court of appeals found federal constitutional error, but found it harmless? There was no state habeas corpus proceeding because the issue was fully litigated on direct, and now it's before the federal court. Everybody's conceding error, and the question is harmlessness. What happens with 2254D? That's the toughest question of all of these other good questions that have been asked. It really goes to the intersection of uh, the new 2254D and, and the rules of harmless error under Chapman v. California and Brecht against Abrahamson. One circuit has ruled, and I don't recall offhand which circuit it was, but it was in the last month, and, and if you need it, I can get a cite for you. One circuit has, has ruled on the question uh, of whether the new 2254D replaces uh, pre-existing uh, harmless error law, holding that it did not. So it seems to me then we have to then get into a question of whether the state court's application of the harmless error rule was an unreasonable application, which is about as convoluted as you can get on habeas corpus. OK, can I ask a follow-up? Um, because uh, if a state is hearing this on direct appeal, they're not going to be using Chapman or Brecht necessarily, and they can be using their own state harmlessness standard rather than Brecht or, than Brecht or Chapman. Does that affect that question? Well, it, it affects it only in degree, not in terms of type. Uh, we'd have to look at the type of review uh, and compare it uh, in, in the particular state system and then compare it to what was available uh, under a Chapman type test and see whether that's enough to satisfy it under a Brecht type test. Uh, there are a couple of cases, I don't want to say like this, so I would say not unlike this in the Eighth Circuit, uh, and I'll be happy to uh, send some citations your way. Thanks. Thank you for that, that great question. And a thank you, Ira. 
And thanks to all of you who faxed and phoned in your questions. We're going to take a five-minute break now. When we return, Cynthia Rapp will share her perspectives on ADEPA and death penalty cases with Judy Roberts.
Welcome back. I'm talking with Cynthia Rapp, and we're delighted that you're joining us again. Please send in your faxes and call during this prog program, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the segment. Cynthia, thank you for joining us on our capital case update. First question for you. What changes has the Supreme Court seen as a result of ADEPA? Well, as Ira had mentioned during his segment, um, now in order to file a successive habeas petition, you have to first request permission from the Court of Appeals. So obviously, the Supreme Court is not seeing as many successive petitions. Um, on the other hand, what we are seeing is an increase in the number of an original writs that are filed with the Supreme Court. Though I have to mention that in the last 75 years, the Court has not granted such an original writ. And could you clarify that? How many votes does it take for an original writ? Well, the court has never really publicly stated specifically how many votes it takes. Um, this discussion has come up because in the Tarver case that was issued um, in February of this year, there was an original writ filed in that case, and the court denied the original writ, but there were four justices who noted that they would vote to set the case for oral argument. So there was a lot of speculation then that obviously it must take five votes to set the case for oral argument. That's really the only thing that the court has come out with that would give that type of indication. Okay, thank you. From the clerk's office perspective, could you tell us what decisions court staff need to be ready to make when it comes to filings and last minute cases? The biggest thing probably is to try to decide ahead of time what rules you're going to enforce. And, and what I mean by that is that when you're getting a last minute um, petition or filing in your court, you know, the problem becomes is that do you want to be the one that's going to not accept the filing because of a technicality? For example, we had a case recently out of Texas in which the petition was filed the day of the execution. Um, they faxed the petition into me and it was clearly over our page limitation. But at that point, I don't feel comfortable in saying, you know, I'm not going to accept this for filing because it violates our rules. You need to go ahead and redo your whole petition because at that point, whether or not they get it in in time at all is going to be a question. So I'd rather have the court make that decision than the clerk's office. Um, so that's just one of them. And there's other things as far as table of contents, the font, the print size. Those are things you need to think in advance. What is it that you're going to be the stickler for and what other things are you not going to be? So it sounds like some strategic thinking and planning beforehand mm -hmm. really makes it much easier for all staff. Mm -hmm. Now what happens if a filing comes in and the court staff know that the court doesn't have jurisdiction. Uh, that's along the similar lines as the rules, and then that has happened. Um, as I stated before, in order to file a successive petition, you have to first request permission from the circuit court. Now, if the circuit court denies permission to file a successive petition, that ruling of itself is not, you cannot be the subject of a petition for certiorari. That's what the statute of death estates. Um, so if we get a petition from that where they're basically applying for cert from that decision, I know clearly we do not have jurisdiction over it and the court has let the clerk's office know that we don't have to file those. But again, in a last minute situation, you know, a day of the execution or hours before an execution, if someone attempts to file a petition for certiorari on that issue, I'm not going to be the one that does not accept it. I'll let the court instead take the case and then they can dismiss it for lack of jurisdiction, which is what they've done on a couple of occasions, but at least it's coming from the court and not from the clerk's office. Right. Is there anything else that clerk's office need to be making a priority? Um, one of the things, in, especially in the last minute cases or when you're dealing with things after hours, is it's really important to know where everyone is, and that includes the judges. Um, on the lower courts especially, you need to know how to get in touch with them and when they want to be contacted. For example, do they want to be contacted when, when the Supreme Court finally finishes up the case and rules so that they know it's totally over, or do they just want to be contacted when something's filed in their court? So you need to have after hour numbers or beepers, whatever it's going to be, and also for the attorneys that are working on the cases. If you're going to be issuing an order after hours, you want to make sure you can get in touch with those attorneys to let them know what your court's decision is. Right. It sounds like communication is central to having a contingency plan that's going to be working well. And I know you're a big advocate for the courts having good contingency plans. There are many districts that are now facing death penalty cases for the first time in a long time or for the first time. What advice do you have for them as they begin to make their plans? They really need to have set procedures in effect before anything happens. Um, what exactly, as I spoke before, as far as what rules are you going to enforce? Who's going to handle things? How are you going to handle things? What hours are you going to be open? Are you going to accept things by fax? Are you going to be open after hours for filings? Um, you make sure you have backups in case somebody who's going to be handling it's not going to be there. 
Um, another thing would be is to make sure you have contacts with all of the other courts that are going to be involved. Know who it is that you need to contact in the other courts to let them know what you've done or to find out what it is that they're doing so that you have everything all prepared before it happens. Um, one, for one example from the Supreme Court level, one of the things that we've run into on occasion is that there'll be an execution set for a specific time, say 6 o'clock in the evening. We get filings in a couple hours before the execution time. I need to know in advance what is the state going to do if we haven't ruled? Are they going to hold off the execution? Um, do they need a, an order from the court or will a phone call from me saying the court has instructed me to ask you to hold off? And those are things that need to be decided before so that you're not faced with this, you know, 20 minutes before the execution and no one's really sure what you're going to do. So the prior planning benefits the court, it helps you out, mm -hmm. and it just makes the process uh, much more efficient. Right. I've heard you compliment the courts many times. I know you think they do many things very well. Could you tell us some of the things that you've been very pleased with their work? Uh, one thing is tracking the cases. Um, the, the lower courts track them very well and let me know what's going on, which is very helpful. Another thing is they will they send copies of what's been filed in their court. You know, usually I like to rely on the attorneys to do that, but they don't always do that. So the lower courts have always been extremely receptive to faxing or overnighting me copies of whatever has been filed in their court because what we, we do with those is we circulate those to all of the justices in our court, which helps us when we have to make a decision within a couple of hours. At least they've seen the lower court filings so they have some sense of what the issues are. Mm -hmm. What hasn't worked so well? Some practices that you would not recommend? Uh, the, really the only one that comes to mind is the passwords and that's kind of always been a, a pet peeve of mine. I'm just not a big believer in them. Um, the people I deal with I usually deal with all the time so I know who they are and I've never seen a case where there's been any confusion about whether or not a court has actually issued an order. I've never seen someone try to to fake it and say that they're from a court or something like that. So that to me, that, that's something a little bit, I don't want to use the term overkill, but it, it really is to use passwords. So any communication, the other communication styles are much better than mm -hmm. going with the password. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia, whenever I travel throughout the courts, your name is the one that comes up when people said, I had this question, I had this problem, but I was able to call Cynthia Rapp. So they know that your communication style works and you're recommending increasing communication on their part. What tips can you offer them? What do you do that works so well? Probably the two biggest things are sharing information and being proactive. And, and by being proactive, what I mean is I, about two or three weeks before I know there's a scheduled execution, I get on the phone and I start calling the attorneys, I call the lower courts, and I try to find out what's going on, what are they going to be doing, what are they going to be filing, and, and that is very helpful. The other thing is I always will share my information with the other courts and with both parties. I don't keep any secrets um, unless a party asks me, you know, the state may say, you know, what's going on or something. I'm not going to share confidences that an attorney gives me. But I do try to be very upfront with people about what's going on. If I don't know something, I'll let them know. I'll say I don't know anything now, but if you call me back in a couple hours, I may have better information for you. Those are some good points for all of us, especially letting people know what you don't know. Now, you've been working with the death penalty process for quite a while. I'm sure there are some changes you might like to see made in the process. Could you talk about this? One of the biggest things, I think, is the timing of executions. Um, for some reason, most of the states have routinely done their executions in the middle of the night, typically midnight, um, which makes for late hours for all the court staff and for the attorneys that are involved in it. And there really isn't, uh, from what I can see, a real good reason for doing that. Some of the prisons are the ones that are most resistant because they say people are in lockdown and things. But a couple of the states that do the most executions, for example, Texas, used to do them in, at midnight and about five or six years ago changed and now does them at, at six o'clock their time. And they've been, you know, having no problems whatsoever with doing that. So I, I would say that would probably be the biggest thing. And, and you have to look at it in the full scope, too. Last year there were 98 executions. Um, so far this year, and we're not even through June, there have been 44. So each year the number of executions increases, and if you have all of the people involved in these things working until you know, midnight every night, it gets extremely difficult. I, I can see your concern for the staff involved also. What challenges do you face in working with attorneys during these long hours? Well, sometimes attorneys, for I'm not sure what the reason is, is they feel if they don't share information with the courts, it's going to help them or they're leery 
of, of sharing information with us, and that's happened on occasion, and it can make it difficult. We had a case in which the attorneys kept saying, yes, we're going to file, we're going to file, and then they never did file, and I really think that they knew all along they weren't, but they, they weren't 100 percent sure, so they wanted to make sure we were going to be there, and I would have much rather had them say to me, I'm not sure what we're going to do, and I can understand that. I mean, these are stressful things for the attorneys also. Um, but just be upfront and be honest with us instead of trying to, to pretend you know, you're going to do something you're not. If you don't know, just say, we don't know. But it had two courts, the Court of Appeals and myself, stayed at the courts um, respectively until 1 in the morning, and then they never filed and we all went home. So you know, we, it, that seems to me that that's something that doesn't need to happen. I hear you. Uh, what about judges? What about their communication? It would be helpful if the judges would communicate with their court staff. Um, for example, when you start out at the district court level and they get something filed, the judge knows that he or she is not going to make a ruling on it for a day or a couple hours or something like that. Share that with their court staff so their court staff in re you know, return can share it with me so I can say, okay, we know that the district court's not going to rule for five hours, so if people want to go get something you know, for dinner or need to go home and run errands and then come back, they can do so. Um, otherwise, we're all sitting there kind of waiting for that order to come out so that we can immediately um, circulate it to all of the chambers. So things like that would be helpful. So any advance notice, no matter how small, mm -hmm. can definitely be an asset to the management of, of the process. Yeah. Um, what else do we need to keep in mind? I think as far as the lower courts need, you know, again, it's the big picture kind of idea as to when is the execution scheduled and then how much time do we have when things are filed. Um, if something's filed in a lower court and they take two or three days to rule on it, then it goes up to the Court of Appeals and they spend a day or two that often leaves the Supreme Court with, you know, three or four hours to deal with it. And so, I mean, the courts need to be mindful, if they can, of the time crunch that everyone's in and try to spread out the time so that everyone has an adequate an amount of hours to actually give due consideration to their filings. Just like everything else today, Cynthia, you now have technology added into the process. Um, how has the Supreme Court used technology and death penalty appeals, and is it a help? It is a help, and what we have done, the Supreme Court um, does not accept fax filings for anything except capital cases, and this is the only instance in which we will accept a fax. And, and prior to faxing, the parties have to talk to me first um, to make sure that it's okay, because if they're two weeks out from an execution, more often than not, we'll ask them to overnight it as opposed to faxing. But we will accept the faxes, and that obviously has helped, though you wonder sometimes if it, you know, if in some ways it hasn't helped because now they can file an hour before the execution, so, um, we, and we do get that. But it does make things a little easier. Is email a factor? It is, and it's becoming more and more a factor. Um, I have a standalone computer in which I can accept um, emails over the internet, and then I have to, to do a kind of a clumsy process of downloading them, scanning them, and then putting it into my other computer. But it's still faster than getting a fax and making nine copies of the fax and circulating it to all nine chambers. And in the last couple of days, um, there have been a, num a few executions, and we've gotten the brief in oppositions and a petition for certiorari all by email, and it, it was much quicker and cleaner than getting a fax. So it can be an asset mm -hmm. as yes, you it progress. Can. Yeah. Now we understand the Supreme Court has a website. Yes, finally, um, mm -hmm. finally there. Yeah. Um, what do we need to know about it? Well, it basically it's a very, very good website. It's got a lot of things on it. Probably one of the things it's lacking, which a lot of the attorneys and staff would find helpful, is the docket system. Unfortunately, that's not on it yet, um, but they are working on that. But the court calendar is on there. Um, the opinions, which is probably one of the bigger helpful things, is you can, there are links to all the opinions, and they're normally up there within an hour or two after the court has released them. So that's extremely helpful. Very good. I know that uh, we've already received some faxes in today for you. Um, what I would like to do is to um, ask you one more question of my own, though, because as we've been talking about communication, I thought, what is your preferred method? How would you like people to, to approach you, to let you know they're now the death penalty clerk or in whatever position that they would need to be talking with you? Yeah, people who are going to be handling this at their court's level, if they've actually got some cases coming or they think they are, um, it would be best if they just called me and kind of introduced themselves. And then if they had any questions about how we want to work together, we could do it over the telephone. Great. So that personal touch, and then you'll be able to, to work with them effectively through the year. Right. Very good. Well, we are pleased to be here, and we're looking forward to your phone calls for Cynthia Rapp. Um, I know I was buzzed that we have a fax here, so I'll start with this. 
uh, while we're waiting for phone calls. Uh, Cynthia, the first question is, the court, uh, what if the court does not have time to rule? Our court um, has a very a practice, really, that we always will rule on a case. Um, I can't recall an occasion where we don't. And as I spoke before about re processes and, and procedures, one of the things is, is you won't, we will ask the, the state to hold off the execution or we'll issue a temporary stay. Um, our court can rule very quickly. We had an execution last night in which the court ruled in about an hour and a half um, on a petition that had been filed. So that's not normally an issue, and I usually try to assure the parties that their case will be acted upon you know, prior to the execution date. Okay, very good. Uh, we're still waiting on our phone calls, um, but we do have another fax coming right in. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have a fax from the Eastern District of Oklahoma, and it says, Will you accept calls from the district courts? as to whether you have ruled on an original petition within the last few days before an execution. If so, can you give us a telephone number where we can reach you? Uh, the answer is yes, I would accept phone calls on that. And I think you said you were going to put the phone number yes. up on the screen. Um, and you could either ask for me or actually anyone in the clerk's office should be able to look that up on our docket system. If you know the, As long as you know the petitioner's name, we can find it in the docket system. So anyone would be able to help you um, answer that question. So you should be seeing that on your screen at the present time. You should be seeing the phone number on your screen. And as I said, Cynthia is, is very accessible to everyone that needs to speak with her. Um, I also have another fax. Just a moment. Um, the phones are working. We do want to let you know we have 10 lines. Um, this is an interesting question. What if the attorney will not tell me what they are planning to do? Um, fortunately, do do? that does happen sometimes. And, and what you want to do in that case, and you know, what I would do, is try to stress the attorney that it's only going to help their client and the courts you know, go through the whole procedure if they let you know in advance what they're going to do. Because if they don't tell you that they plan to file, they may find that the court is closed when they finally get there at 6 o'clock because you didn't know anything was coming. Um, and another thing you can do is call the other courts that are going to be involved in it. Call me, call you know, the circuit court or the district court, and ask them if they've spoken with the attorney and what do they know, because sometimes, for whatever reason, the attorney may have told someone else. Um, so that's another way you can get around that. Have you ever intervened by calling the attorney in that case when someone's called you? I can't recall specifically if I have, but I have always called the attorneys myself in addition, so if I've learned anything, I certainly would share it. Um, with the uh, the lower courts and and I've got some weight behind me because I can say you know I'm calling from the Supreme Court and the justices would like to know I mean because we've got nine that are going to rule you know, the lower courts the district court there's only going to be one and the circuit court normally it's just going to be a panel and we've got nine individuals who are going to need to know and need to be contacted um, so we really do need to know in advance and it helps to say I'm with the Supreme Court yes, it does very good um, I believe we have one more fax too they're still still here um, this one says, how, how do you know there is going to be an execution? How do you find out all the information you need? Um, I have contacts in all of the states that routinely do executions and even those that have one or two a year and, and I've always gotten contacted in advance um, about the executions. Uh, I keep a list for the justices, for the court staff, which is um, done once a week and it's um, circulated throughout the court listing all the upcoming executions for the month. Um, and I have my own list which I keep which probably runs about two or three months out so I'm always aware of, of when they're going to occur. And if the states don't contact me, the courts of appeals are also very good at letting me know um, what you know, executions are coming up in their circuit. So there usually is not a problem at all in keeping track of all of the capital cases that are coming up. And again, that communication factor is critical for it working for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any phone calls? It appears we do not. So, but we appreciate your, fact, uh, your faxes. These were excellent questions. And I'd like to thank Cynthia for sharing her expertise. Mm -hmm. And now I will be turning the program back to Fran Toller. Thank you, Judy and Cynthia, for such an enlightening interview. We're coming to our, uh, towards the end of our broadcast now, and I have a question that I have to ask of Professor Robbins here. 
With all the restrictions that you previously described, is this the end of the road for habeas corpus? Well, of course, Fran, that's the, the ultimate question. Uh, in a sense, it, it, it really is not. If we look at the language in some of these opinions, for example, in Slack v. McDaniel, one of the cases I mentioned before, uh, Justice Kennedy, who is not really a, a proponent of an expansive writ of habeas corpus, wrote that the writ of habeas corpus plays a vital role in constitutional rights protection. Now, is this a way of just paying lip service uh, to the writ while continuing to narrow it? Uh, maybe not. In fact, probably not. Look at what they did, uh, not just at what they said. The prisoner won in three out of the four habeas cases in the Supreme Court. Uh, so it, I would say, admittedly, habeas corpus is not as vigorous a remedy as it has been in recent years. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, is this like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic? We're not at that point, uh, or we're not yet at that point, uh, at which we would say that review of state court convictions can be had only in the state courts, not in the federal courts. Habeas corpus has always operated as a safety valve. Uh, judges would look to see whether there was a degree of comfort uh, in, in, in terms of comf being comfortable with the justice uh, that uh, was promulgated in that case. I would say it remains to be seen how comfortable uh, the federal judges are with the restrictions imposed on them by the 1996 Anti-Terrorism Act uh, and uh, on what's going on in the state courts in terms of fair review of convictions and sentences. Thanks, Ira. That certainly is uh, um, enlightening, you know, to me. I, I was wondering as we were uh, summing up, we've heard from uh, Cynthia and Judy, if you had any uh, final thoughts for our audience today. Well. I would say the work that you do is as important as it gets in, in the judicial system and in the legal system. Uh, I, I would say don't worry about what you read about habeas corpus and about death penalty in the media. Just do your jobs and do it well. Uh, habeas corpus is still available, uh, can be applied, can protect constitutional rights in appropriate cases. Your judges uh, will decide for you what's appropriate and you should understand habeas corpus law and practice well enough to help the judges get to where they want to go in these cases. Thanks, Ira. We've covered a lot of ground today, and we want to thank everyone who's participated in the broadcast, from Ira, Cynthia, and Judy, and especially to all of you who viewed it today and faxed in your questions and your wonderful phone calls. Let me remind you that all the material related to the broadcast today is on our website, and we would encourage you um, to get those materials if you have not done so. One final thing, at the center it's very important to us to know exactly how we're doing. So if, and we also like to know, just as uh, more than for just curiosity's sake, who watches our broadcast. So we do want to remind you that we would like you to fax in our class roster and evaluation sheet. And we, because we do care about who attends, and we're very interested in what you think. For those of you who are applying for CLE credits, the information on that is also found on our website. We should know by the first week in July which states uh, have agreed to give credit for this program. Thanks again. You do very important work, as Professor Robbins said, and we at the Center are proud to serve you. Thanks for being with us.